Let's talk about the use of knives, trench knives and daggers in World War I trench fighting. So something that World War I is quite famous for is trench raids, trench fighting. Now trench fighting meant that the type of weapons being used had to adapt very, very quickly to the circumstances. It has to be said most European armies were not particularly well prepared to fight in the trenches. However, by 1915-16 particularly, we start to see a lot of changes in the type of equipment and the type of fighting being carried out in Western Europe during World War One. Now, one of the most famous types of weapon to come out of World War One are trench knives or trench daggers, known by both names. And in fact, they, um, they come in a wide variety of different types. And I'm not gonna address that in this video. Well, in this video, I am gonna look at um, the evidence of their use and how their use was described in period newspapers. But before we go on, just a very, very quick word from our wonderful sponsors for this video, who are Raid Shadow Legends. Raid's an awesome fantasy turn-based combat game that you can play on your mobile phone or PC. And can you believe that this month, April, Raid turns three years old? Happy birthday, Raid! And to celebrate Raid's third birthday, let's have a quick look at my top favorite three champions from Raid. So first up is Kytis, who's from the Knight's Revenant, and uh, He's one of my mainstays, he's almost indestructible and wears black and yellow, my club colours. Next up is my Orc Shaman and she is a really, really reliable character, very good in combat, but most importantly she can resurrect players when they're killed. And my third favourite is War Maiden from the Barbarians because of her absolutely awesome outfit. This month there are two bonuses on offer, one for new players and the other for existing players. So if you're not playing Raid yet and you're new to the game then this is for you and it's a great time to start. If you check out the link in my description below or scan my QR code on screen you'll get a huge birthday package worth $40. We're talking about three free champions all at once, Miseracord, Tiger Soul and Romero, plus 10 Magic XP brews, 10 Force XP brews, and 10 Spirit brews. That's absolutely huge. All this treasure will be waiting for you up here in the inbox, and remember that's only for new players and for the next 30 days. But if you're already playing Raid, fear not, because we've got something for you as well. As a third birthday celebration, all new and existing players can get a bunch of free birthday gifts worth over $25. Once you're in-game, after clicking on the links, just enter promo code 3 years Raid to get your hands on everything. It's as simple as that, and I'll see you in-game. Now, just very briefly for anyone who doesn't really know what a trench knife or a trench dagger is, um, just briefly to explain that various forms of knife were used in close combat in the trenches in the Great War or World War I, and some of those were specifically designed in, during World War I, specifically for trench raiding and trench fighting, and they were marketed as such and sold as such. However, there were also lots of other hand weapons used as well, including different types of knife that hadn't specifically been designed uh, with the Great War in mind. Generally speaking, the non-specialized types of knife being used included all of the types of hunting knife, dagger, bowie knife, even large kitchen knives and butcher knives, and also, of course, bayonets. Um, and uh, this is the typical British um, bayonet used in World War One, famously used in World War One. However, it's also also worth mentioning that out of service models of bayonet like this earlier model here the 1903 were pressed into service as um, trench knives as trench daggers and this is true whether we're looking at the British Army French Belgian uh, Austro-Hungarian German whatever okay Russian they all made use of whatever equipment they had available. Not only did they use previous models of bayonet and sometimes shortened the blade, sometimes changed the profile of the blade, but they also used other implements like bill hooks. Um, obviously the Gurkhas used Kukris, other people made use of Kukris as well, not just the Gurkhas. Um, and so all sorts. Aside from those, there were also specially designed trench daggers which came in a variety of different forms. Some very specialized for stabbing, thrusting, um, thrusting blades essentially, some specialized more towards uh, chopping or cutting. A lot of them were a compromise, cut and thrust blade, different types of hilt, different types of hand guard, including knuckle duster grips, um, skull cracker um, spikes on the bottom and all sorts of varieties. I will look at trench knives and trench daggers, the different types, or at least the main different types, in a future video. But here, now, we're going to look at some sources. So here's a relatively early mention of the trench knife um, a, a, from 1915. This is from August 1915. And this is featured in the Bolton 
London Evening News, um, August 1915, and it's titled The Trench Knife. And it says, The Periscope for many months has been the most prominent novelty in the window displays of West End stores and outfitters. For obvious reasons, trench warfare, they dug in, being able to look over the top of the trench without sticking your head over the top and getting sniped, very good idea. But both in number of the patterns displayed and in the space given to them, the periscope display is now being rivaled by that of the trench knife. So trench raiding by August 1915 was evidently becoming a thing which lots of people were thinking about. The trench knife, says the Sheffield Telegraph, London contributor, is a grim development of the combats in narrow communication trenches where there is no room to level the bayonet or even swing the butt. Germans and French used them in the cellar fighting in Suchet and the Labyrinth. Now our officers at least are inquiring for them. One can have a 14 inch bowie knife with a heavy backed blade, almost like a cleaver, or one can have a little stiletto. That's a really nice description there. So, you know, a bowie knife is a thing that's been around for more than 100 years, well, about 100 years at this point. And, um, but equally, types of dagger had been around. So clearly at this point, people are just Whatever their preferred type of knife for fighting is, that's what they're buying. They're not necessarily specialised trench knives by this point. But the most grisly looking instrument is the steel knuckle duster, from the side of which protrudes a four inch poignard. So this is a more specialised trench fighting knife now, to be used in a backhanded blow when Germans and English are pressed body to body at a tra traverse corner. So, you know, that actually gives us a whole load of information in quite a relatively concise article. Um, and we can tell that there's a wide variety of different knife types available, some of which we might, in the modern world, in military collecting circles, refer to as a trench dagger or trench knife. And others of them are just knives. And in fact, from photographic evidence of the period, we can see soldiers sometimes carrying large cook's knives. A similar but shorter article in the Edinburgh Evening News, also from August 1915, titled Trench Daggers. It says, shops in the West End showing cutlery are, says a London correspondent, doing a considerable business with army officers in trench daggers. These weapons vary in size and pattern. Sometimes they have a decided medieval appearance. More deadly weapons for the infighting, which is so frequent a feature of modern trench warfare, could hardly be desired. They are described as straight plunge dagger or stab dagger, knuckle duster dagger, trench dagger and thug knife. So you can see there that there are various, as I say, various different models, but equally they're starting to attract their own uh, characteristic names. Um, and so, you know, you can tell straight from that, a knuckle duster dagger, we know what that is from surviving examples. Um, and it's very clear, and notice also it mentions army officers. So there, this is, uh, this is also connected to the general abandonment of swords in the trenches. So it was in 1915 in the British Army, I believe, if I remember correctly, that the general order went round to pack away swords. They were found to be too unwieldy in trench raids, and there was no great use for them. Now, obviously, army officers carried revolvers. So for any of you out there who are going, whoa, this is crazy, this is the age of gunpowder, why weren't they using guns? They were using guns. But if you jump into a trench and you've got five or six shots of a revolver, some of which might hit, some of which might not, um, and have whatever effects on whatever number of opponents, you might not have time to reload your revolver. So frankly, having something in your other hand that you can stab with is super, super useful. Um, and it's, it's a similar equivalent, really, to having the sword and revolver in the Victorian era, for example. Or indeed, similar to having the rifle, um, the bayonet on the end of your rifle if you're jumping into a trench as a rifleman, as an infantryman. Now that last mention in this article of the thug knife is an interesting little insight there. In a lot of these articles, if you read between the lines, uh, you look at some of the implication of how it's written, it's very clear that the use of knives and daggers for fighting was not something that the British were particularly au fait with, to borrow a French expression, uh, and it was often seen as a foreign thing. So oftentimes in newspapers we read about uh, you know, men fighting it out with their fists, and if one of them pulled a knife, that was seen as unmanly uh, or foreign, <laughs> and these two things were often equated as the same thing. Uh, you know, in that in that period, sort of mindset. So, it, it, in the British newspapers, the fact that these uh, soldiers are becoming thugs by using knives, 
out of necessity is something worth mentioning um, and knives very much have been associated with the criminal underworld at this time so them being used in war was actually for the British at least something really quite new. Now accompanying these descriptions of trench knives and trench daggers being sold commercially which tells us one piece of information that they were being sold we also have to wonder were they actually being used actually was most fighting being done with guns and, and, and grenades Yes, I think it was. However, hand weapons certainly played a part. And if we look at the photos of trench raids of the time, we know that soldiers made extensive use of things like shovels and um, pickaxes and um, any type of you know trench clubs, manufactured trench clubs, all sorts of uh, truncheons, maces even were made. Um, all sorts of hand weapons were used in trench raids because you couldn't do everything with the bullet uh, and frankly you couldn't necessarily reload in time either and here is a, a article it's a descriptive account which i'll only read you a short section of from the dublin daily express august 1916 and it's titled into the bosch trench now there's one section of it where the uh, person reciting his tale um says uh so he says uh in a twinkling we realised that we had struck the Bosch line instead of our own line so they'd accidentally gone into German lines and what followed was too confusing for me to remember much about. No doubt we both realised the necessity for keeping that chap quiet. Now that's very very important and I think something that gets over certainly I think I sometimes overlook in, in my accounts and I think other people have as well. Use of a weapon sometimes is all about quietness. And of course, the one thing that the commando dagger or the trench dagger is very good at is killing someone silently. Shooting them, not very quiet. Banging them over the head with a shovel, not particularly quiet either. However, sneaking up behind them and shanking them while covering their mouth, quiet. Okay, so sentries are often dealt with with knives, even up until modern times, of course, but famously in World War II. Um, yeah, so no doubt we both realised the necessity for keeping that chap quiet. And I can remember the jolly feeling of my two thumbs in his throat. It was jolly, really, though I dare say it all seemed beastly to you. And Slade, I suspect, really did for the chap. We were lying, Slade is his friend, um, we were lying on a duckboard at the bottom of the trench, so trying to hide, trying to be silent, not trying to rouse the enemy. And, um, and now my little trench dagger fell and made a horrid clatter, which I was sure would bring more boshes, but it didn't. So little d detail there <laughs> that he's clearly got a trench dagger. He doesn't actually mention using it, although it's sort of implied that they dealt with this sentry silently. So I suspect that he'd just used it, basically. He goes on to say, and I'm sorry to say that I left the little dagger there, but I collared the Bosch's rifle and bayonet, thinking that was the only weapon I had, and clean forgetting the two Mills bombs, grenades, in my pocket. And it goes on to describe the rest of the account. So there's a few th interesting things implied there. He's obviously got a trench dagger on him. I think he's probably used it to kill the sentry, or his friend Slade had done equivalent with their trench dagger. And he regrets that he... Uh, left it behind partly by accident I think probably partly by just trying to get away as quickly as possible um, so there we go it's definitely something which if it's not causing a huge number of casualties is present and is very much something if you were doing these types of sneaky sneaky trench raiding type activities you definitely want to have on you wouldn't you regardless of how much you're going to use it you don't want to need one and not have one so here's another descriptive account of action in the field this is from July 1916 and um, it says I lost touch with my fellows after I got peppered in the thigh shot or shrapnel perhaps in the beginning of the village fighting but my orderly stayed with me and we did a bit of amateur first aid we dressed a bomber and two other fellows a bomber is someone throwing grenades uh, not of my battalion either of them in quite professional style the bomber still had seven bombs grenades they were always known as bombs in British uh, literature of the time. And the others had rifles and bayonets. And I had my revolver and trench dagger. This is telling us actually a whole bunch of really interesting stuff that we know from other sources. So trench raiding was commonly carried out by squads of men. Those squads of men often involve people with rifles and bayonets who obviously shot and bayoneted. People with hand grenades who obviously threw hand grenades in. And then an officer... And this is a revolver and trench dagger. And here, the trench dagger has clearly replaced his sword. So essentially, the trench dagger for officers is the stand-in for the sword. He has a firearm for close-in work, 
and a, a dagger. In former days, it would have been a sword. For when you've missed with the revolver, run out of shots, you don't have time to reload, or someone's grappled you, or whatever. Okay, so it's actually quite a traditional setup, and it should be mentioned also these squads of men, some with rifles and bayonets, some with bombs, and grenades, uh, and so on and so forth, operated together in different roles. So they often performed different tasks during a raid. Now, during the Great War, First World War as it's now known, there were various fundraising and patriotic um, exhibitions, should we say, that were held all over Britain, and I dare say it happened in other countries as well, sometimes to raise uh, money to pay for things like tanks and planes. Um, but there is an ex exhibition being described in the Linlithgowshire Gazette um, in June 1916 here, and it's um, essentially, it's a exhibition of relics from the trenches for civilians back home who've got an interest in seeing some of this stuff up close. And it says, of the offensive weapons displayed, special interest was aroused by the small trench dagger used by the British Army and said to be very efficacious in hand-to-hand -hand fighting in narrow trenches where free play cannot be had with the bayonet. Now that's a super important point to mention. Okay, so one of the reasons that trench knives and knives of all sorts started to be used increasingly in the trenches is trenches were often made in zigzag lines or other complex shapes to prevent shrapnel and bullets flying all the way up them and killing all the people in the trench. So therefore when you're trench raiding often you're in very tight spaces often there's a lot of people in there and there might be other obstructions as well and sometimes some of the trench might be falling down or you know a bit collapsed or whatever um, but basically a rifle and bayonet of the time is a fairly long object are not very wieldable. So knives held in the hand became very, very useful. You could also relate this to fighting in buildings as well, whether in the Great War or today. It goes on to say, it is a remarkable little contrivance of a deadly kind, and looking at it, one could easily understand how in expert hands it would prove a terror to the hated Bosch, who has been responsible for the use of the villainous saw bayonet and poison gas. So here we see typical kind of demonizing of the, of the enemy, uh, saw bayonets were nothing new and they're used for sawing wood. Uh, they not, don't make it any more of a, the so-called butcher bayonet don't make it any more of a fearsome weapon. And we'd been using saw bayonets by pioneers in the British Army going all the way back into the middle of the Victorian period. So nothing new. Anyway, um, but it is, uh, you know, again, we see this impression that it, of British people of the time were not used to seeing things like trench daggers or thinking about that kind of thing. They were quite separated. But nevertheless, in 1916, they were nevertheless regarded as a prominent type of trench fighting weapon. Now, another source of these descriptive accounts were the wounded coming back to Britain um, from the Western Front. And this is an example of an officer, wounded officer, coming back. This is reported in the Dublin Daily Express of August 1916. And this wounded British officer is recounting uh, part of the Battle of the Somme. Um, now I'm only going to read a small, it's a very long uh, descriptive account, but I'm only going to read the section that's of interest to this video. And so he says, you heard how we got on, of course. C and D companies um, suffered pretty heavily, I'm sorry to say, worse than we did. It was a complicated job. We had to rush the trench first, followed by B troop. Then we had to rush to the support trench and keep Bosch as busy as we could there while C and D cleaned up and consolidated the front line, which was to be permanently held. As it turned out, the Bosches had considerable difficulty with their men. The beggars simply wouldn't turn out of their dugouts to face us. We found barely five and twenty men in front in the front line, and those, of course, we absolutely smothered, took them in our stride, you know. I got one myself with my trench dagger. Explicit description of use of a trench dagger uh, to take out an opponent there. And the CSM, which is Company Sergeant Major, who was next to me, killed three, to my certain knowledge. I saw it. He doesn't say how he killed him. Um, possibly, bay uh, my guess would be um, bayoneted. Um, but these are people who are not having time to reload. So they are literally, ch you know, charging through hails of bullets and then going from trench to trench. Elsewhere in this article, he describes people who were shot between trenches. So the overall trend and impression you get from this is that running between one trench line and another, people would get shot. But once you were in the trench, then it was 
a lot of hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Um, and so, you know, an explicit description here of an officer, British officer, uh, killing an enemy with a trench dagger. And to him, this is just something to mention in passing, probably because it was happening all over the place. Uh, and the CSM, um, the company sergeant major, probably using a bayonet, but for all we know, he could have been using a trench dagger as well. So brutal, brutal, horrible stuff. But you know, I don't think there's any question, certainly in 1916, certainly at the Battle of the Somme, trench knives, trench daggers, they were being used, definitely. So here we have an account from the Yorkshire Post and Leeds Intelligentsia um, of uh, July 1917, describing a, um, a conflict between the French and the Germans. And it says, they knew that a considerable proportion of the men opposed to them had been in the sector for a long spell and reckoned that their fighting powers had been considerably reduced. Moreover, they were certain with something between 10 and 12 battalions of fresh troops to outnumber the men opposed to them. But they reckoned without the dash and tenacity of the French line and chasseur battalions. The artillery came to the rescue immediately with a heavy barrage and an instant later, the French returned to their frontline trench in a splendid counterattack. The Germans had attacked between two storms and the rain had fallen uh, that had fallen had made the trenches, which had suffered heavily from the enemy guns, almost impassable. Yet the French returned to the charge and the enemy had no time to get into position his trench guns and mortars. There followed a hand-to-hand -hand struggle with bayonet, trench knife and grenade. The shock troops had met their match in vain, they tried to carry back the trench guns and mil military users, I can't say that word well, uh, that they were bringing into position. A French sergeant seized the muzzle of a small swivel gun that a German was bearing off. Another German shot him down point blank, but his comrades captured the gun. It goes on like this. So um, again, this is, you know, this is the type of trench fighting where people are using everything they can and it's very fast, very rapid, and very close range. Where there are artillery pieces or mortars or such like here, they are being physically grabbed from opponents. When you're in physical grabbing range, obviously bullets are involved, but also, as we see here, trench knives and bayonets are also being used. Here from February 1916, we have the Sussex Agricultural Express um, uh, reporting a commendation where it says of Sergeant Luck, good name, uh, the next big engagement in which Sergeant Luck was in was the Battle of Lewes on the 26th of September. On this occasion, his battalion were in general reserve. The reserve forces attacked at four o'clock in the afternoon and walked up Hill 70, facing the famous Hohenzollern Redoubt and gained much ground. He was with Lance Sergeant Oliver Brooks of the 3rd Coldstream Guards when he won the Victoria Cross by retaking a part of their trenches with a party of bomb throwers, grenades. On December the 10th, two days after his 24th birthday, Sergeant Luck led a bomb attack in the night for which he's been recommended for a commission uh, to become an officer. This took place in the Laventi district. To use his own words, he, and it quotes, saw the German sentry off with a trench knife or dagger as a rifle or revolver report, um, sound, would have let the enemy know of their presence and then went about 700 yards and routed the enemy out of their trenches, capturing one and bringing him back to the British lines as a souvenir. Um, so <laughs> someone who's repeatedly uh, gone above and beyond the call of duty here. But uh, again, a really nice detail here of a trench knife or dagger being used and uh, seeing off a sentry so you don't necessarily need to, to well, it, it, that's, that could be political, for, uh, political language for having killed him or literally seen him off, um, who knows. But clearly this is another example of when a firearm makes a loud noise that you don't want uh, to happen if you're not trying to rouse the enemy. So trench knives or daggers, very, very useful for silent killing, just as they were used in World War II as well, of course. Now it's also interesting to mention that the use of hand weapons and things like trench daggers or also have an effect on morale, both of your forces and of the enemies. Um, and, the, you know, undoubtedly, weapons are as simple as much as they are 
just a mechanical weapon. And there's an interesting, very propaganda fueled uh, article here from April 1918 in the Yorkshire Evening Post titled What the Germans Think of Us Now um, and subtitled The Growing Fear of the British Soldier. It opens with the statement, a great change of opinion has taken place throughout Germany in regard to Great Britain throughout the long period of the war. And without reading the whole thing, in a nutshell, it basically spends a lot of words explaining how the Germans hadn't really respected British soldiers at the beginning of the war, but now they're terrified of them. And indeed, the reason that I came across this article was because I was searching for information on trench knives. So I'll just read one paragraph from uh, this bigger article, which does mention a trench knife at the end. Uh, to cut a long story short, there has been in Germany an increasing fear of the British soldier. He's no longer a mere sportsman. He no longer shows what they consider fear by shaking hands with the German when he's taking prisoner. He is a barbarous fellow. In the Englishman, including of course Scottish, Welsh, Irish, Canadian, Australian, New Zealand and Cape soldiers, he fights unfairly, was the most complaint made. The Germans especially admire him for this, for they frankly admire unfairness. They found that he will fight with his fists, a brick, a pickaxe or a trench knife. So again, this is part of the overall context that we've got to see trench knives in, that it is seen as a barbarous weapon, but it's seen as a barbarous weapon with barbarous needs of the barbarous time. World War One was a big wake-up call for lots of European uh, militaries and, and politicians and civilians. Um, and this was seen as a new age and the trench knife perhaps where the sword and the bayonet had, had prevailed before. Now the trench knife was seen as the sort of barbarous, up-close uh, weapon of, of taking enemy trenches uh, with no mercy. But of course there was also the practical reasons for using the trench knife. And in fact, many, many articles, I'm not going to read them all, I've just picked one out at random, basically repeat the same information again and again in different words, but meaning the same thing. And this example uh, from January 1916 says, the latest thing in articles of destruction is the trench knife, which has a blade of about 15 inches. Well, that's a massive generalization. In fact, trench knives varied hugely uh, from six inches to um, 15 inches is very big, um, and which is used in fighting in the trenches where there's no room to swing a sword or bayonet. So again, we come back to necessity here that trenches and the particular characteristics of trench fighting meant that a knife was a more practical weapon than a, even a bayonet was and certainly than a sword was. Now just emphasizing this point I came across a um, award of a, of a presentation sword for this is from 1916 so again we're slap bang April 18, 1916 we're completely in the period here when the trench knife is starting to become just you know massively known about and very very popular and the the article is called the noble profession of arms it says on Saturday afternoon at St William Williams College, York, at the presentation of a sword of honour to Second Lieutenant H. O. Johnson, an old min Minster uh, chorister, Major General H. M. Lawson, CB, Company of the Bath, a General Officer Commanding in Chief of Northern Command, speaking on the profession of soldiering, said the presentation of a sword of honour to Second Lieutenant Johnson in recognition of his having worked his way up through the ranks to a commission seemed to him to be exactly the way in which they should mark their appreciation for him. In applause, it mentions in brackets. It was true, of course, that the sword was no longer the active weapon that it was in the past for an infantry officer now went into action not with a sword but with a revolver and a trench knife. Boom! There we go again. So this is 1916. Um, this is this shift seems to have happened in 1915. So in British, certainly British infantry officers, and I think French as well, went into World War One carrying swords. As soon as trench warfare um, really got underway in 1915. That's when they put their um, swords away and went to trench knives. But it is still interesting to note that the trench knife is really occupying the same place as the sword. So the officer doesn't abandon all hand weapons. He still has a revolver and a trench knife, where formerly he had a revolver and a sword. So really the trench knife has just become a mini sword. Now, of course, with the introduction or popularity of um, trench knives and how, how they became popular, not just for officers, in fact, but for, for everyone in uh, all of the main armed forces, we find Austro-Hungarian, Russian, German, French, Belgian, all different styles of trench daggers in use at this time. 
People also inevitably are going to discuss what are the best ways of using these new weapons, new-ish weapons, new to some of those people anyway. Um, and there was an interesting uh, quote here, which is talking about, this is from February 1916, about um, French soldiers, basically um, what they do when they're not in the trenches at war. And it says, among the soldiers themselves, military shop played an important um, part of war at the present moment and is an absorbing profession as there was much much discussion which uh, uh, much con con discussion concerning such subjects as trench mortars and grenades the merits of the minenwerfer which is a type of mortar and the best way of striking home a, a with the trench knife or bayonet so it's interesting that um, although this is the the first era of what we'd often call combatives and um, so training for soldiers in hand-to-hand -hand combat in a very systematic way in world war one uh, it's clear that with these trench knives which in many cases were non-regulation weapons and private purchase privately owned weapons there was obviously various different theories going around about well what's the best way to you know hold this point down, point up, what's the best way to defend against a stab to your guts or a stab to your head or whatever. Um, and we see this in various sources where they're talking about um, you know, different types of um, trench knife or trench dagger, but also different ways of using them, because clearly a different design of dagger is going to be used in different ways. Now, it's interesting how many articles and texts of the time talk about the profession of arms. Obviously, it was evolving quickly, but everybody had noticed that in the peculiarity of trench warfare, there were some elements of combat which had gone back to earlier periods. They were using, you know, for example, clubs and maces and, and things like this. So the fact that there was a parallel actually with some forms of warfare which and the use of the dagger, which seemed to have been passed out of general use, came back into use in World War One. And um, in The Scotsman of January 1916, it says, Sir J.H.A. MacDonald contributes an interesting article on war today to the February number of uh, Chambers Journal. It's pointed out that in the present conflict, the combatants have reverted to the use in many methods and principles of fighting, which were in vogue in earlier times. Thus, the howitzer is the successor of the old siege mortar. The armoured gun carriage, mechanically propelled, is the modern prototype of the Roman testudo, or wall of shields used to cover an advance. We also have the revival of hand grenades, steel helmets, and the dirk, or trench knife. And it goes on. Um, so it goes on. In fact, it makes some quite dubious comparisons. But nevertheless, there is some truth there, isn't there? There are some things... Armour came back in, trench knives came back in, clubs and maces came back in. So there's definitely some degree of truth to this kind of observation that the peculiarities of trench warfare meant that sometimes people were now looking backwards to older styles of combat. Now, in fact, to delve deeper into this, J.H.A. MacDonald um, is quoted here in the Pall Mall Gazette from November 1915, and this article is titled Suggested Substitute for the Bayonet. And this is, you know, relatively early in the war still. And uh, MacDonald says in a letter to the Times, advocating the use of our soldiers of a short knife or dirk. Now, you might be saying, well, that's what we've just found out that people were doing this whole time. But there's a difference here. So what he seems to be suggesting is the regulation introduction of a fighting knife instead of the bayonet on the end of the rifle. So he says, when the soldier jumps down into a trench full of enemies, as he must do when charging, unless he remains above to be shot at, he is no longer able to use rifle or bayonet to advantage. He is like a man in a close crowd who cannot draw back his weapon so as to make it effective. Accordingly, we read of men taking off the bayonet to use it by hand, and also of men resorting to their fists. Everything points to the advisability of a short knife or dirk being at instant command when the jump into the trench is made, and this not for thrusting forward, as in striking a blow, but for backhanded action, and the arm being swung with the blade projecting, a dagger action in fact, which is much the quickest and most effective way of dealing with an enemy who is close upon you. Now this is going to be, I think, quite remarkable and interesting to people who talk about medieval dagger uh, treatises, and we talk about point down, you know, ice pick grip, or point up. And uh, he is very much in favour of using this grip 
And the reason he gives is for close in action, because in close in action, this is more useful than this. He goes on to elaborate, the mode of use would have to have it out just before jumping into the trench and to swing it into the face of the nearest man and as rapidly as possible into the faces of as many men as can be reached. So essentially frantically stabbing around at face height with the point down. So for stabbing at the faces of as many men as can be reached, no stabbing at the body, he says. The purpose should be to flabbergast your man. Shock, in other words. More than merely to wound. A jab in the face is the most effective way of getting in first, which is everything in a hand-to-hand -hand struggle and the most disconcerting injury. Well, isn't that interesting? And there's some parallels here with what... Um, Fairbairn later says, uh, to do with thrusting and indeed in some cases cutting at the face in order to threaten, disorientate, distract the opponent. So yes indeed a stab in the body might be more likely to kill someone, however a wound in the face is incredibly disorientating, distracting, could even blind you, but it's more of the shock value of that. So this guy has, on McDonald, has clearly thought about this an awful, awful lot. And isn't that interesting? Because at the end of the day, taking a trench isn't necessarily about killing lots of people. It's about swarming and overwhelming, morally overwhelming, the opponents in the trench such that you can take the ground, hold the ground, and potentially take them prisoner. And let's face it, um, you know, huge numbers of people were taken prisoner in World War One. We often focus on casualties in terms of death or sometimes in terms of wounded, but huge numbers of people surrendered or were taken uh, prisoner. So very, very important and insightful bit of text there. So I hope this has been interesting, thought-provoking, useful, educational maybe even. Um, I will probably look, in fact, I'll, I'll definitely look at trench knives and trench daggers in the future. We'll look at some of the types that were developed and I'll also keep digging for some primary source descriptive accounts of their use because I find it super interesting. I am interested in the Great War and I'm certainly interested in uh, trench daggers and trench knives and they are something I come across in my militaria and arms and armour dealing uh, career as well. Uh, so maybe I'll try and find out some, um, get some original examples to show you uh, on camera and we can talk about together. Any comments, questions, thoughts, things you'd like me to cover in future videos, post below, get chatting. Give us a like and a subscribe. Those likes really count for a lot for me. And of course, I hope that you're subscribed. I'll see you back on the channel really, really soon, folks. Cheers.